Well, Mayor, thank you for being with us today and taking time out of your very busy schedule to answer some questions that are very important to our young professional demographic. Mm -hmm. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Um, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about your background um, and what was the most important personal career decision that you've ever made? And maybe how did that um, decision shape your political aspirations? Well, I was born and raised in Tulsa, went to uh, graduate from Bishop Kelly High School and attended uh, college and uh, uh, graduate school out of state, came back to Oklahoma. And probably the biggest decision, early decision I had regarding my career had a lot to do with my father. He had always advised me that whatever I did do, make certain that you go out in the field, he would call it. And that would be to learn where things are done or where they're made or where, the, where all the action is, in other words. And I did that. I decided, uh, matter of fact, at one time, I, my brother and I were running, uh, my father had a cattle ranch, and uh, we ran that for a couple of years, and I didn't know anything at all about cows <laughs> other than what they looked like, and uh, spent quite a bit of time baling hay, building fence, uh, working with animals, uh, working with the veterinarian, all that, all that type of stuff. So I learned a lot about the cattle business by doing that. Same thing when I approached my career with the oil and gas business. I worked out in oil fields for several years, and that taught me a lot. Taught me, first of all, that's where all, all the work happens, mm -hmm. but it taught me how to deal with people, how to work with people, and for them to understand that I'm just like they are. We had the, the capability then of interacting and understanding each other's language and learning the business and this and that. When I became mayor, I did the same thing. I went out to all of our facilities, not just the buildings, but I went to see how the water sewer plants operate and learn to meet the people and learn what they do and what their interests are. So that decision of whatever I did do was to go out to the field first had a lot to do with the success that I feel like I've uh, been fortunate enough to, to experience in the political arena. Great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Let's talk a little bit about infrastructure. Hello, infrastructure. When considering relocating for a job, there are various aspects of the community that young professionals look for, just besides their career. Right, right. Um, we look for elements that are, are exciting to us, like nightlife and music and arts and the scene that's going on in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. um, what physical infrastructure elements do you feel are important to attract talented young professionals to Tulsa? Well, certainly uh, our river, water in the river. Wouldn't that be a great thing to finally see, and, and I think we're going to see that fairly soon. But things like our trail system, uh, for those of us that have grown up in Tulsa, we don't realize the significance of our trail system. It's about 200 miles in length, and that's so much more than most other cities all around our country. And we still are expanding it, and so that's a great, great opportunity. It gets people outdoors, gives us an opportunity to get around better, uh, gives us options for bikes and all that sort. But there's also things like bridges. In West Tulsa, the Gilcrease Expressway, when the bridge across the Arkansas River in, in West Tulsa finally comes to pass, that will open up a very significant area of Tulsa, really the last area of, that, of, of Tulsa that is of, of significance for development, all different kinds of development. But it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It's the southern part of Osage County, all the hills and the rolling plains that, that we see, and it'll be available to, uh, to us very easily. West Tulsa itself, very interesting area. A lot of job opportunities, a lot of business can be grown there. And those with a good entrepreneurial spirit will have an opportunity again by opening up that area for commerce, trade, whatever it might be. Great. Well, moving on to the environment. Mm -hmm. um, sustainability is a key issue for our generation, one yep. that we have a crew d dedicated just to sustainability. Right. Um, we care about recycling and reducing our carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. We want to preserve our resources for many years. What actions can the city take to make sure that we are making good decisions for our environment? Well, we lead by example, and that's really the, the, the most significant action we can do. And we've done things since I've been mayor of really focusing on things like compressed natural gas. We take a business approach because we do have limited dollars that we can spend. Therefore, if we spend money on certain activities uh, that are very expensive, they're nice, but they, can we really afford them? 
I'm in the oil and gas business, and on the roof of my building, I have 20 solar panels. That was the very first commercial installation of a solar panel uh, project, in, certainly in the city, and I think in the state of Oklahoma. And I found out very quickly that, although it's a very nice thing to do, and it does uh, contribute 15 to 30 percent of our electricity needs, it's very expensive. And the payback, because of our low utility costs, is 15 to 20 years. That type of rate of return on a city standpoint, since we have limited resources, is not a good payback. So in my view, we should avoid situations like that. Great things to talk about, but for us to be involved with it, not, not a good idea. Compressed natural gas, it's an immediate savings. The, uh, the, the, the difference in cost of compressed natural gas equivalent to a gallon of gasoline is very significant. It's about a dollar thirty-five, dollar forty versus three dollars, three dollars and twenty-five cents, three dollars and fifty cents plus for a diesel fuel. So that payback is immediate. That we are getting involved with in a big way. Uh, our uh, transit system, our buses are uh, being changed over to CNG, uh, but the same thing with our uh, trucks, our automobiles. I have a uh, actually two vehicles in the mayor's office that are powered by CNG. So that's what we try to do. Very good. So on to YP engagement. Tulsa Young Professionals in the Chamber are constantly um, getting involved with legislative issues and decisions mm -hmm. at that level. Um, that's how we help to grow our future in our city. Uh -huh. What's the mayor's role in promoting and engaging the public to be more involved in the political process? Well, there are two or three things that we can do. About 20 years ago, when I was on the city council, uh, I came up with the idea uh, of getting more people to be active and, and uh, be part of our meetings, because nobody ever showed up. Well, we were having our meetings at City Hall, and it's very difficult for a lot of people to show up because mm -hmm. they can't get to work, they have things at home, et cetera, et cetera. So at my suggestion, we started going out to the city council districts to have our weekly meetings. And it was a little, for some reason, it was controversial at the time, <laughs> which I didn't think, I thought it was pretty smart. So we started going out every month, we go to a different city council district, and that was really received very strongly, very well. And that started, I think, a process where uh, people got engaged. So that was, a, that was something we've done. While I've been mayor, we've done the same thing. City Hall in your neighborhood, it's a program that we instigated when I first became mayor. Going, again, going out to the community, asking them what they want to talk to us about. Because it's interesting, it's one of the few times that somebody really has a, an opportunity to have a direct contact with their public official. Right. Whether it's with the mayor or with the city council or both. And we've done, we've done both of those things. I've also had a very uh, aggressive outreach to TIPROs. As you know, you were involved with the ABCs, authorities, yes. boards, and commissions. And we always said, let's find some people from TIPROs that want to be involved, that want to learn, that want to be part of this community for a long time. And the authorities, boards, and commissions, uh, there's over 600 people that I can appoint to those positions. It's a great learning ground, and it's a great place that uh, a person can really have a lot of influence and a lot of capability and, and meet a lot of people and a lot of positive things. So being very aggressive and getting people involved, either in outreach or by getting them involved in, uh, with authorities, boards, and commissions. That's what I've tried to do. Great. Well, moving back to infrastructure, mm -hmm. in surveys, our, mem our membership, uh, we constantly find that the river development is a high priority. I know you spoke to that a little bit before, mm -hmm. but a full river means river development, community development, and I believe it will instill pride in the, in the city and in the people that live in that city. We have a lot of great projects happening around the river right mm -hmm. now with the gathering place. Right. Um, but what concrete, tangible action items will you do to get a functioning dam built to replace Zinc Dam? Well, in that interim period of time, what we're doing now is uh, we have committed a significant amount of money uh, in collaboration with um, uh, the River Parks Department, county government, uh, as well as uh, PSO uh, AEP, the electric company. And we're now just beginning a process now of repairing uh, the three gates that are leaking. That's why the water never stays in the dam because it, it's leaking. So we will, uh, su we're supporting financially a process that's going to repair those gates and it will provide water in Zinc Lake 
and it won't leak out. And that should be good for five to maybe even a 10 year period of time. So that will give us finally a, another good opportunity to see what it looks like. So people don't have to just think about it, they can see it. Sure. And then at that point, we will uh, again start a process of coming to see what we can do. We're certainly going to support financially through our capital improvements process, uh, the gathering place. Mm -hmm. uh, what I believe we can also do, what I've asked uh, our Tulsa Parking Authority to do, is to evaluate the parking capabilities that we have as a, as a city government, where we can help and provide parking or the financing of parking or the process of providing parking oversight at specific locations up and down Riverside Drive as well as in West Tulsa. I just received that, uh, uh, that, that bit of information about a month ago. So if we are aggressive in how we use those authorities, boards, and commissions to help us from a, from a financial and a, and, a, and a feasibility standpoint, then we can go uh, and be part of the process with private industry when they say, well, where would be a good place for us to develop something? Here's some information. Mm -hmm. Here's what we can do as a city to help you provide the need because parking is always a big deal. Parking is a necessary part of this whole process. And if we can provide parking, besides helping a, a, uh, a new restaurant or a bar, for example, locate on the river, we can also serve as a good way, way station for people that want to park a car, get on a bus, get on a trolley, get on a shuttle, whatever it is, and go around the city. And then at the end of the day or end of the night, come back, and that's where the car is. So it's that type of, of foresight that, uh, that we are very, very engaged in. Good. So moving on to life balance, um, as you know, Typros hosts a great event every year called Street Cred mm -hmm. um, that works under the mantra, when no area of the city is neglected, the entire city benefits. Mm -hmm. This is um, not a process with an end, but it requires continual effort behind you know, the community leaders, the city, um, to help see it move forward. What specific initiatives will you or would you promote to bridge the needs of our old and young in creating and sustaining livable communities for a lifetime in the Tulsa area? Boy, that could be a two or three hour discussion <laughs> very easily. But in my view, you have to have a starting point and to me it's providing a good education and not just the kind of the traditional education of going through high school with the concept of being prepared to go to college. Unfortunately there are many people that fall through the cracks. They aren't going to go to college for whatever reason. It's not mm -hmm. their fault necessarily. It's just they're not going to go. So are they being prepared now when they graduate? What's their option or what are their options? They don't have very many today. Mm -hmm. There's no real pathway to prosperity for those that don't want to go to college or aren't going to go. So what we need to do and what I proposed in my State of the City address a few months ago, that we need to collaborate, pull together, which I've done, the leaders of the educational institutions, public and, and private, as well as our VOTEC system, as well as our private industries. I suggested locating a facility at the airport to where people, while they're children, while they're going through high school, they will be exposed to a variety of options. They could either end up being an engineer in, in aeronautics, or they could end up being a, 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 a maintenance mechanic or a jet mechanic, or work with av avionics, or work some manner, shape, or form, learn a trade, learn to work with their hands. For that person that, that is not going to college, he or she will then have an opportunity to continue their education in a very quick manner and be able to provide for themselves very quickly. Today, those jobs are really in hot demand and they pay very well and they pay good benefits and they can be achieved without having to borrow a whole lot of money to get a college education. Once we, once we get that established, then we will become a very hotbed of, of, of uh, uh, need and an attraction for business because we will be able to fill a pipeline uh, of personnel to be hired in a variety of industries, in particular with this concept, the aviation and aerospace industry. So that to me is a good beginning. When we can provide our, uh, education and economic development opportunities for people right now that are not participating in the one Tulsa concept where we're all in this together, that will get them an opportunity 
to get a leg up and be on, on, on equality with everybody else. That's what we want to do. Great. Let's talk about education a little bit. Okay. Um, in this country, a good education should be the right of every child. Um, however, we know that in Tulsa, education can be difficult in certain areas of our city for students throughout the city. Mm -hmm. um, when we know that education is a key factor in the long-term professional and financial success of every person, how can the mayor's office ensure that the education received by our children is equal across the city? Well, you know, the mayor doesn't have any control or real direct say-so over uh, our public school system, for example. However, I do have access to the bully pulpit, and it does work, and it does catch attention. What I just talked about with giving uh, a pathway to prosperity for other options is a real key component of that whole, uh, th that whole concept, that whole idea of providing equal opportunity and a better educational opportunity uh, to our kids that, that are growing up. That to me is still a very, very key component of it. I've seen many times where uh, in other countries where they have almost a requirement that if somebody's going to go to college and be an engineer, for example, they also must have the capability of making whatever they're going to be talking about or engineering. And having that capability is a huge asset. It's a, it's a, it's a great opportunity for them. We have opportunities right now in Tulsa, for example, Memorial High School. They have an engineering program where juniors and seniors, those that, that are accepted, uh, there's about 30 or 40 of them. When they graduate from Memorial High School, they will have the equivalent of almost a year and a half of college credits towards an engineering degree. If we had that same capability throughout our system for all the different variety of uh, uh, jobs or careers that anybody can think of, hooray, then that means that we will really be able to solve a lot of problems. I know that in some parts of our city, the people that live there have not been given the economic development opportunities or the economic opportunities that the other parts of our city have, and that's not fair, it's not right. We have to be able to provide them to everybody, and everybody in this, throughout this entire city must have that capability. Thank you. You're welcome. So moving on to diversity. Um, diversity is an essential component of a successful business school and city. Mm -hmm. TyPros focuses multiple initiatives on this important and the importance of inclusion. Um, we even have the diversity crew that puts on a lot of wonderful events throughout the year. Right. Um, the benefit of a multitude of experiences can be seen in every aspect of a community. To what extent is it the mayor's duty to ensure that diversity is valued and protected among all of the communities in Tulsa? I think it's a very, very important component of a mayor's responsibility without, without question. And again, that's the one Tulsa concept. When I became mayor, I noticed there were two groups of people that really were, have not been participants in a lot of things the African-American and Hispanic communities, for whatever reasons. I also found out, knew, that their social structure revolves around churches, community churches, local churches. So Victoria and I, my wife, Victoria and I, uh, early on began attending and participating every church we could go to. We've been to 112 so far. Wow. And we go there with the idea of we're not running for office but we're going there to learn and to listen and to establish a relationship and a rapport with a community that has pretty much been left out and that's not acceptable to me so we've accomplished a lot do you remember that tragic good friday when two idiots started going through an african-american neighborhood shooting people Three people were killed, two were shot as well, injured severely. And because of the relationship that I was able to foster with the African American community, its religious representatives, uh, the political representatives as well, mm -hmm. we were able to get through that very well. The police department helped tremendously because they arrested the two sus suspects very quickly. But when the national media came in and wanted to 
show Tulsa as revisiting its race riot history, we were able to say, no, we're not that way. We embrace our diversity, and here's why. And we gave a lot of examples. So being able to get beyond that and to look forward, not back, but to look forward for the opportunities that our diverse culture has or should have or will have, if we have that, and people buy into that, which they, they do, then our city is going to be transformed in a huge way. Already has started it. We've already started that. That's great. Well, that kind of leads into my next question about public safety. Mm -hmm. um, it's the top of the mind of a majority of people in the city, oh, yeah. as always. Mm -hmm. um, safety is an important, important issue for everyone and young professionals included. How are you going to make the streets safer? By having good people, for one thing. Uh, I was very fortunate to be able to uh, appoint a gentleman named Chuck Jordan to be our chief of police. And he is far and away uh, the best. He's done things with very limited resources by starting what's called the BEAT system. We had a system prior to uh, my becoming mayor and prior to him being police chief uh, that really did not put our police officers out in an efficient way where they, they weren't just running all over town like chasing something. They were given and assigned specific areas of town now under the beat system where they're responsible for those areas and they know them very well. Mm -hmm. As a new recruit comes on, he or she is given the mentoring of an individual that has been in that particular beat for quite a while. So then that new officer gets to know everything about that particular neighborhood. They get to know the people, the, the businesses, who should be there and who shouldn't be there. Uh, if a truck is suddenly out of place or if a light is not on that is normally on, they get to know it and they can ask and see and, under, and try to understand what's going on. That's a, a significant par part of it. We also utilize uh, a lot of statistics to know where problems are. And then Chuck is great about putting together task forces very successfully, but we collaborate. It's just not a, not a one-man band, so to speak. We have a history now of collaborating with the other police, policing institutions, like the county sheriff or the U.S. Marshal's Office, the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation, et cetera. And we have periodic uh, activities. Uh, one of them is called Operation Triple Beam. This occurred three times now very successfully where people that have existing warrants or are having problems, we target them uh, for good reason and they are taken off the streets. Uh, the weapons that they possess are confiscated and the crime rate drops like a rock. It's amazing what it does. So we do that very, very successfully. We also uh, need to understand that having a a, a verifiable and a, a constant source of revenue uh, source of funding to pay for these officers. It's very, very important. We've made attempts at doing that. We haven't been too successful yet, uh, but we're going to continue on doing that. We now have had four continuous police academies, and we're catching up with our numbers that we need to, in order to have sufficient numbers for the policing uh, of, of our neighborhoods. Uh, but it's a real strong commitment. It's my number one priority, public safety. It's a lot of work. It is. It is. A lot of very, very good people do it. Well, let's move on to health care. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma ranks low on a multitude of health rankings. Um, additionally, the disparity of health care availability throughout the city is discouraging at best. Right. Typros believes all residents should have access to quality health care. How can the mayor's office improve health care outcomes for the Tulsa population? Well, a variety of, of, of ways. We certainly promote uh, a healthy lifestyle. And again, we have to lead by example. Mm -hmm. uh, Victoria uh, has been very, very aggressive in that, in that way and has been a very strong participant. She's done everything from uh, teaching and, and, and making uh, children aware uh, of what nutritional values to being very involved with establishing vegetable gardens in neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, that's been a very good outlook. Matter of fact, she had a, a garden in West Tulsa that she was uh, uh, active in, in promoting and, and establishing. And she was able to get uh, children from one of the local grade schools, grade schools to come over and be part of the process, learning how to weed a garden, how to grow something, vegetables, what they made and why that is such a big deal. Well, those kids on their own 
were interacting with the senior citizens uh, group. And they went to a nursing home and they found out that some of the, some of the people that were living there did not have access to vegetables. Hmm. So they put two and two together. They got the vegetables from the garden, they brought them over, gave them to the senior citizens. Now they have a better nutritional diet. So, and the kids now understand the link. And they also understand the significance of working with senior citizens and how valuable they are to the community, but how that humanitarian aspect that they're now learning, that they have just learned, that'll be with them the rest of their lives. So it's amazing what can happen by just growing a garden. That's wonderful. It is. It's a great story. Well, thank you so much for being with us today and, like I said, taking time out of the busy mayor's office schedule to oh, yeah. answer some important questions for our YPs. Is there anything that you'd like to say, I mean, that we haven't discussed yet? Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, have a lot of very good questions. And many of them really are very appropriate uh, to the young pros, young professionals. But they're very appropriate to the entirety of our city. I mentioned the outreaches that I've had very successfully to encourage more people to be involved with our government as well as uh, being involved with appointed positions uh, that I have the opportunity to appoint, uh, to appoint to. But I also know that the uh, young professionals look to the future. What's in it for me? What can I do? What positive aspects of being in Tulsa can I count on uh, for the next 10, 20, 30 years? When I was sworn in as mayor in December of 2009, I was the fourth mayor within 10 years, fourth different mayor. And that lack of continuity of leadership really is a detriment, in my view, to the successfulness of that 10 or 20 year period of time that we're thinking about. When a city has continuity of leadership, has continual leadership in the business and the political community, and when everybody works together collaboratively as we have exhibited during my tenure as mayor, then we can be extremely successful. Look at Oklahoma City. Look what they've accomplished. Look at what cities like Austin, Texas have accomplished. Portland, Oregon, Louisville, Kentucky. There's all over the place, but they have continuity of continuous leadership and vision where whatever that desire is and whatever the, 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 the uh, understanding of the community would like to achieve, everybody gets together. And we've done that numerous times since I've been mayor and had the pleasure of being mayor of the city of Tulsa. We work extremely well with the county leadership. We work extremely well with the county government. We have several cities and towns in and around the county of Tulsa that we have now established a very positive relationship and has, and has allowed us to collectively approach a lot of issues very collaboratively. We've even done things with the county where we used to have duplicative services. We both did the same thing. Well, we got together, figured that out, and we got rid of one, kept the other, and joined them together. We both serve the same taxpayer, you, so why not do that sort of thing? Make government run more efficiently. I'm in the oil and gas business, and I understand uh, job creation and economic development very well. That's why I ran for this office, and that's why I want to be reelected, so I can continue on our economic job creation success. Can you imagine what it's like when you see somebody that has been given the opportunity to have their first job? The hope that they had in high school, that each of you had in, in high school, has now been realized, where they have hope for the future, not just for their future of having a job, but they see hope that they'll be able to, pr to pursue whatever they want to do because of that job. I've had the, the real honor of being able to provide that, to, nine, to help provide that for 9,000 people in the past three or four years in the city of Tulsa alone. And I want to continue that. November 12th is election date. Please vote for me, Dewey Barbett, for my reelection to continue on the continuity of purpose that we've exhibited so far. And we can help you uh, make certain that your next 10, 20, 30 years is going to be well spent in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thanks a lot.